Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Chambers. Uh, Senator Niall O'Donnell, please. Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks to uh, the officials for their presentation so far. Um, a number of colleagues have asked questions that I was going to ask already, so I won't engage in uh, repetition. I do want to hone in on this issue uh, identified by uh, Jack and Martin uh, in relation to the uh, movement of people who are in emergency uh, accommodation. I would like to know, uh, Ms Buckley, just in terms of uh, when you say at one hand this was addressed with the provider, but then you have also said you can't impose standards on emergency accommodation. That's a screaming admission to me. That's a screaming contradiction. Um, so I suppose my fundamental question is, while it's all well and good as far as we know it hasn't happened since, can it happen again? Uh, it's two different things, um, Senator. Um, what we cannot do is impose direct provision standards on private, pr private hotel owners. Um, but what we can say in circumstances where uh, there's a very clear breach of, of what we anticipate as being the requirements of, of somebody who's providing this emergency accommodation, we can say we'll withdraw from, from using that, that hotel or that facility. So um, we, we believe that it, it is certainly possible for them to meet our uh, contractual requirements, but what we cannot do is say to them, you have to meet all the standards that come with being a direct provision centre. Mm. And that's, that's the difference. Would you deem that as a breach, people being shipped away for a weekend to facilitate? Oh, and um, we, we addressed it with the provider. Has that provider been closed and people relocated? Um, what, what, we, what we said was if that happened again, we would close. And, uh, and how would you know if it happened again? Because um, uh, just as, just as we, we found out now, um, typically um, if, if residents are being moved, they, 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 would, they would bring it to the uh, attention of, um, of RIA and um, we, 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 we would know um, if people had been moved. Well, uh, with the greatest respect, I understand what you're saying and I understand the, the dynamics at, at play here. Um, but I don't think it's good enough to simply rely on that. We're talking about people here who are facing extreme marginalisation. People who are facing massive uh, issues, PTSD, uh, all kinds of things, and we're just going to hope that in a few weeks they're going to tell us via a third party that they have been shipped in a bus a couple of hundred miles down the road to God knows where in the precarious situation they're already facing. I, ju I just think that's, that, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge that you can see the emergency accommodation situation is not. Uh, acceptable and not fit uh, for purpose, but this is this is a scenario that, that, that we are hearing and that is imminent, and that there seems to be there are no uh, uh, no measures in place uh, that can uh, proactively uh, and preemptively uh, prevent this kind of situation stopping again. And I have to say, I'm extremely uh, concerned by the fact that this has been identified already uh, in terms of an existing provider, and that person uh, and that facility is still operating, and there's people still. Uh, existing because it wouldn't quite call it uh, living in that accommodation. So uh, I, I want to make that uh, point. Uh, Ms Buckley, earlier on you identified rightly the issue of value uh, for money. I'm wondering is there a definition of what value for money is, if that's written down uh, anywhere, uh, if there is a terms of reference in terms of uh, that statement, uh, ensuring value for money. What does the department constitute as value for money for a person living either in emergency accommodation or direct provision? Um, we, do, we don't have a, a written statement. As, 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 as civil servants, we are required to achieve value for money in the use of taxpayers' money. Um, and I think, as, as one of the other members of the committee pointed out, that means that we have been achieving um, uh, that uh, a, a per person, per head, um, uh, um, cost of somewhere in the mid-30s. That cost is going up because as we go through the existing procurement process and without revealing any commercial secrets, um, in order to meet the higher standards, um, there will be a higher level of cost per person per night for people in the new model of direct provision centre. Um, but that's the right thing to do because those are the standards that we must meet. But currently it's around 30 odd euro. Uh, so it's in the mid 30s. And that, is that in both for, for the old, for the uh, the centres that were contracted under the older model? And is that in direct provision and in emergency accommodation? No, in the emergency accommodation, we're paying rack rents. Mm. So we are paying the day, the nightly cost of beds in those hotels. Okay. Well, so um, that is a huge cost pressure within the budget for direct provision. That's kind of mad, isn't it? 
it's certainly a position we do not want to find ourselves in. And that is why we are working extremely hard to move people with the right to remain out of our direct provision centres, because if they were not in the direct provision centres, we would be able to accommodate the people who are in emergency provision. Do we have the figure for the amount of people in emergency accommodation currently? It's about 710, 715, but it changes on a nightly basis. Okay. Um, final question, Chair. I'm just wondering in terms of the, uh, the, the statement about the upcoming standards uh, in terms of uh, newly acquired direct provision uh, centres. I'm wondering if you can put, even if it's not a specific figure, uh, if it's more general, I, I'll accept that, around current uh, direct provision providers who aren't meeting those newly uh, defined standards around independent uh, living, cooking facilities, maybe uh, other uh, issues. Do you know how many of them uh, you'll have to close based on the, uh, the, 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 the new standards to which you uh, mm -hmm. referred? How many people can expect to be uh, relocated into those uh, new centres? And how long, I suppose, will they have to wait until they can uh, relocate into those uh, higher or what's deemed to be uh, higher standards okay. within direct provision? About, two, about 10 or 11 centres at the moment meet the independent living standard. Um, so about 2,500 people have uh, independent living centres. That's the arrangements that the members will have seen in Mosney. Um, about a further um, 1,400 people have access to independent cooking facilities and uh, are, can, be, can provide their own food. They don't have the, the on-site shop. Um, we are aiming by the middle of next year to have completed the procurement process and achieved uh, the uh, new standards um, across the entire uh, complex of direct provision centres, both uh, the existing ones and new ones that may come on stream through the procurement process. And obviously we do need additional direct provision centres to come on stream to provide us with additional beds. Um, I don't have a figure in my head about what, uh, what centres that we currently have may not make the, the standards. And I should say that um, it, it isn't the case that it is necessarily because they will meet the standards and not meet the standards that centres open and clo or close. Uh, so, for example, we have a, a Hatch Hall, uh, which is due to close in Dublin City Centre. Um, there's no suggestion that that's closing because it won't meet the standards. That's closing because of a commercial decision that they're, they're, it's being redeveloped into a hotel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. The next.